Hi, welcome to Go on the Run, and this is section 24, part 8, and today we're going to be looking at digital identity. Now, sorry about the delay, but as you know, if you've been following closely, that I recently moved and that was time consuming. I had to take a break in February, early February, because of all of that. And it turns out that trying to find a place is also very time consuming. And yes, it's just a mess. Um, so um, hopefully things are going to calm down in soon. I don't know what soon means, if it's a month or two or several months, whatever. But hopefully things will calm down and I can get back to sort of getting videos out more frequently. But we shall see. Um, anyway, I'm very excited because um, what we have today is going to be a little bit long. But I'm going to try to see how I can speed it up for you. Um, just remember that all the code that I write is in the repo. I'm going to post the link to the repo again. It's down in the description below. So don't freak out. Don't worry if you see me speed up the code because all you really care about is not me typing it up and seeing while I'm typing is to understand where I'm starting from. And then when I complete it, do you understand what I end up with? And I'm going to try to do my best to explain what I'm starting with and or where I start from in terms of code. And then what's the next piece of code that I'm writing when I finish it. So don't freak out if you see me speed up. I had to say that because some people don't like when they speed up the video and they keep forgetting that it doesn't matter if you see me type it, it's all available. All right, so, oh, one other thing. Well, a couple other things. Um, the previous part seven, if you're not clear on that and you haven't watched it, you really should make sure that you understand that because um, that's where we talk about how to exchange information in a certain way and digital signatures and all that stuff. And so if you don't understand or um, know or haven't seen those previous videos, you really should because some of that material is going to, of course, be in here. And so I'll just assume that you sort of know when I said signature, what I sort of mean or hash, taking the hash, you're going to see me take the hash. You should watch those other previous videos. Okay. Finally, um, I spend a lot of time on these videos. That's why I cannot pump out a video every single day. I love doing these videos, but it takes time hours really for me to sort of, um, record, prepare and, edit the videos and um, something you might hear me say we in the video but it's really just a one-man show it's me alone doing this so i would like you to do me a huge favor and always smash the like button on all the videos if you're watching this hit the like button this is good for youtube it's good for me um, somehow the youtube algorithm works it just uses those like and subscribe number of subscri subscribers and it helped the video bubble up to the tops where other people can see it. Eventually, hopefully this means that oh, I can start making some money, but right now I don't make anything. And that would sort of help all of us out because it would allow me to free up time in other places and other things I have to do to make even more of these videos, which I really like doing. You know that a lot of these videos have several, you know, sometimes hundreds of like, um, viewers, but yet I only have like two or three likes. So please, please, please hit the like button so that all the videos can get start getting noticed and picked up by the YouTube algorithm and that's going to help me out. Okay. Um, of course, if you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe. If you're watching this video, definitely subscribe. And for those who are subscribed, thank you very much. Okay. Um, let's jump into the material. So we're talking about digital identity and the issue here, issue of trust. So imagine that there's Bob and Anne and Ken, these three individuals. And Bob is friend with Anne. Bob is also friend with Ken. But Ken and Anne do not have a relationship. They do not know each other. They're strangers to each other, right? And they don't even know each other exists. And so Anne has a laptop, very nice laptop there that she'd like to give to her friend Bob. But they're in different cities. But Ken, he's currently visiting the same city that Anne is in. So he is very close to Anne. But remember, they do not know each other. Um, ideally, what we would like is for Anne to give the laptop to Ken, and then he can give it to Bob when he returns to Bob City. Anne is not going to do that because she does not know Ken. Any random person could come up and say, I am Ken, and give me the laptop for Bob. Maybe just close to Anne, and she was talking about, oh, she has a laptop for a friend Bob. So what we need is for Ken to be able to prove that he's a friend of Bob. Now, what you can do is you can take his ID and you can say, here, here's my ID and I can prove that I'm Ken. I live in the same city as Bob, um, Bob, blah, 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 whatever it is, right? But maybe what Ken presents is maybe something 
that Bob has given them to say, yeah, give this to Anne when you meet her, and this will let, let Anne know that you and I know each other, right? Maybe Kent opens his phone and shows Anne a picture of Bob or him and Bob together skiing or something, right? And so Anne can say, oh, yes, I, this is the Ken, and he knows Bob, and it's not just some random guy who stole Ken's phone, but using his ID, I know this is Ken. And why would Anne trust the ID? because it's issued by somebody she trusts. Maybe it's a government ID or something like that, or state ID here in the United States. Once Anne accepts that oh, this is the Ken and he knows Bob, she feels better about giving him the laptop. And so now Ken can take the laptop and give it to Bob when he sees him, right? But notice how Ken and Anne were able to interact and trust each other, even though they're not friends. They use something else to establish trust. And that is what we're going to be looking at today with some examples. So let's take a, another look at how this same sort of issue of trust, not only between people, but between, between computers also exists. So here I am in my Boost Notes. And uh, if you don't know what Boost Notes is, it's just a note taking application. And I'm going to create a new note and I'm going to make a note, a markdown file. Why am I making a markdown file? Well, I want to illustrate something for you. Um, let's say that oh, you're doing computer to computer communication, right? Uh, and what you have um, is you're trying to figure out how these computers can talk to each other, exchange information. Because remember, two computers or several computers would have the same issue of trust like Bob and like Anne and Ken has if they don't know each other, right? So they need to establish trust somehow. So let's um, see if we can illustrate that. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that, I'm just, so what I'm really creating here is a sequence diagram, right? So don't worry, uh, you'll figure it out, you'll see what I mean. So let's say that we had host one and it sent a message to host two. And it says, hello there, host two. Um, you know, I'm, I'm host one, right? So it sent a message, hello to host um, two. Now, host two could respond back and say, tell host one and say, hey, who are you, right? Like, you know, just like what, if somebody says hello to you in the street and you don't know who they are, you may be like, hey, who are you, right? And um, so then host one would then reply to host two. Now, these are computer, by the way. And I'll reply to host two and say, you know, I am a friend of, let's say, if I just refer, friend of Veral, for example, and you know what? And host two can be like, oh, well, host one, you say you're a friend of Veral, okay, I trust you, right? And if you were having a problem with this, imagine that if they had no way of establishing trust, well, then that would just be fine. And so in this case, we can say that how this is unsecured communication, right? Of insecure communication. Because simply by host one saying that how it is a friend of Veral, host two goes, yep, I trust you. And we know that how that is not like um, really, really good. So um, after this, if host two is goes like, yeah, I trust you, then host one could say, well, you know what, since you trust me, <laughs> just but because I tell you I'm a friend of Veral, why don't you just send me that secret um, that Veral has with you? And then host two could eat, quickly reply to host one with, like, yeah, here is the secret, right? And so you can see this is not very secure at all, so insecure communication. Now, this first part here, where um, the computer sort of introduced in themselves, we can call this like the introduction. We'll see later on in TLS communication. This is like, I think they call it LO, right? And then when they get around to start exchanging data over here, this other file, or data exchange rather. Um, so you might hear it called um, that introduction. You might hear it called the handshake. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about that later on. But um, you can see here, like there's these two different parts to this um, 
this whole communication where at first the computer had to connect and you know say who they are and then once they agree that they trust each other then they start exchanging information back and forth right and of course this is insecure communication because the first computer host one simply says to host two that hey um i'm a friend of Verl, and the other computer was like yeah okay i trust you now we have already covered this slide with Anne and ken that the way Anne can trust ken is by having ken prove who we say he is by giving her something that she can trust so let's see how we can do secure communication instead. And in this case, we'll start off pretty much the same way. And let's get our auto number in there to number auto number our messages. And so what we can do is we can also know that we know how there's going to be some introduction that's going to happen. We can also start with that. And so in this case, when host one says, hey, hello, host two, you know, hello, host two, um, host two will respond with, you know, you know, sure, who are you? Who are you? And then host one would have to prove who he is. And so host one would reply, you know, like, I am a friend of Vero. And then host two would be not trusting this time. I would respond to host one and say, you know, prove it, for example. Prove that you are a friend of Earl. And then host one would have to present to host two some kind of thing, right? Something that is signed by, let's say, by me or signed by someone we trust, right? That we, you, that both party trust. And if host one can present this to host two, then host two can say, well, okay, um, host one, I trust you. Right? And host two can do this by looking at that identity. You know, well, this is a self message essentially, and you can verify the identity, verify signature or whatever, or identity, right? Right. And so after it verifies the signature, it can say, okay, I trust you, right? It will reply to host one that I trust you. After this, then they can go ahead and do, you know, the whole message ex exchange thing because no trust has been established. This is sort of like what we want. All right. So what I wanted to do was sort of show you how we humans solve this problem by having IDs that are issued by our government or some trusted um, issuer. Right, which is like a passport that's issued by the government or state ID, like a driver's license or something like that. And um, computers do essentially the same thing, even though we didn't get into here exactly how OST 2, 2 was able to prove that it, um, you know, is, is trusted. But so now let's jump to code. Before I get into the code, um, let me show you this. Um, so what you see me using is um, text to represent diagram and there's this thing called plant UML and um, they have a number of ways to represent all kinds of diagrams, sequence diagrams, use case diagrams, all kinds of things um, using um, just text. Now the markdown editor I was using, like I say, is one called Boost. It's open source and so on and you can go here to boostnotes.io, it's called Boostnote, and you can download it for your mobile devices or for your um, desktop and it's supported on Mac, Windows and Linux. So um, pretty much any platform you're on, you'll get it. Now, if you scroll along, you'll see the scary thing here about a plan and all this other stuff. You don't need a plan. Um, you, this is relatively new that I think the comp they formed a company trying to you know, support the project by um, making some features paid. But if you're going to download it, do not download the newest version here. That newest version is the one that they're working on that has cloud support. Scroll down and download those older versions. And you can see it all, the entire thing is open source and um, GitHub. Once you read the documentation and so on, um, if, you're, if you have like a server or if you even use something like Gmail, you can have the same ability of um, having your notes synced to multiple devices. This is not, the time for me to talk about this, but this is one of those things I can show in my just stuff thing. 
So just want to show you that. Um, Boost Note is not the only one. There are many other notes of um, note-taking application, like I said, out there. Here, uh, there are more note-taking application that um, support this auto format called Mermaid. And so here in Mermaid format, for example, is how you would do the same sequence diagram. Um, whether you think it's simpler than what I did, it's up to you. It's just a matter of preference. And for example, a note-taking app that would support that is one that calls Typora. Again, Typora is open source and it's just typeor.io. Okay, now let's get into the code. Okay, so here I am in our directory and I'm going to start up Visual Studio Code in um, part eight. And the only thing I have now is that markdown file that you see me just created, um, you know, um, that's essentially what I have, just in case you get one of those, um, you get like boost note and you want to paste that in there to see what it renders like, or even if you get typeora, you can just adapt it anyway to see that. So this is going to be in the repository, so don't worry. So let's start by creating our example one. And of course we need a main that go. And so in previous examples, what I would do is the examples we were working on previously is I would write like a sender and receiver to represent two ends of the communication that we're trying to send messages between. That meant that we had to write the data out to a file because that was simpler than us trying to set up like an actual TCP IP network connection and have them communicate that way. Um, today, I'm gonna simplify it even further. I just use go routine and just functions to represent the two hosts that we have. So today we're gonna be dealing with host one and host two. Well, of course, if we want them to be able to communicate with each other, we want to be able to have host one be able to send information to host two and host two to receive that. One of the easiest way we can do this in Go is to use channels. And again, this is channel or string. We're just gonna start off with something simple. And for host two, we're gonna have the exact same thing where it's going to be able to write to a channel to send information to host one and read from um, in channel when host one sends it information. Now, if this seems a little bit complicated, don't worry. All we have to do is simply say, well, save this for us and get our package main there. And we do channel one, channel one. And we're going to say we're going to make a channel and we can make unbuffered channel. We don't need buffer channel. I'll make a second channel and we'll call it channel two. Now, now we have our two channels. It's just a matter of wiring them up correctly. For host two, this is where the switch come in. When you want to send information out to host one, you write it to channel two. And when you want to receive information, you read it from channel one. That's all there is to that. Now, um, what do we really need to do for host one? So yeah, let's keep it simple. I just say that I send a message and I wait to receive a message. For host two, um, it starts off first by listening, right? So it's listening for some incoming requests, for example, um, on that end channel. And once it gets it, it says, oh, um, you want something? Well, I'll send you back something. And maybe it sends back, um, here is the secret. Yep. So just like that, we got this request. And let's see here. I need to put um, da -da -da -da. undefined message. Yep. This is colon equal. All right. So what I've done is I've created um, two hosts. Um, so host one and host two. And if we try to run this right now, if you don't know what's gonna happen is if we try to run host one, it's going to try and send, but there's no one receive, ready to receive message yet on um, the other side of this channel, right? Because host two is not running to try and receive that message. So it's going to block. So this is not going to work. So what we need is to create this as go routine. Now we can easily make this go routine by doing go here um, for both of them or one of them, depending on what we want. Um, but we're not going to do that. Instead, the way I like doing this is I like spinning out the go routine within the function itself. And so since go routines, to kick off of go routine, you actually have to make a function call. So what I'm doing is I'm saying here I have an anonymous function. Um, this bit is the anonymous function here. And I want to call this anonymous function. And so within here, I'll put the code that I want to actually call in that go routine. And so I'll do the same thing below here. And if I save that, that's like that. And if I run this, you're still not going to see anything because um, the go routine is not going to have time to 
get created and actually run. So what we need is something called a wait group and we need to have our main program get to this point and wait for the go routines to, to complete, right? Wait for go routines to all finish their work. So the way you can do this is by creating a wait group. So I say var and then inside here, I do wait group that add and I can say added one to basically say, so, well, I'm going to, it's just one go routine I'm creating here essentially. So I add one, I'll do the exact same thing here. So wait group that add one. And in order, since we're sort of incrementing a semaphore, we also need to decrement it. Now, one of the things we can do is do that at the end of the go routine here, we can say wait group that done. And so that signals that oh, we should decrement the counter essentially within this wait group by one. Now, this is fine to put it at the end of the go routine because we know before the go routine got started, even if you um, if you put that within here, you, it's not going to work. Because remember, if you say kick off a go routine, it's not going to get time to get scheduled. So you want to start off increment this value before you execute this function. Now, you could play around with it and try it, but you certainly want to decrement it when the go routine finishes its work. I remember once this function reads the end, this go routine is going to get cleaned up and go away. But so what I like doing, because my go routine here, the code that I'm writing within here could get very long and I could forget, I might forget to um, call it done. What I do is I do defer as soon as I start my go routine. And so by doing that, I make sure that whenever the go routine complete, the done is going to be called and I don't have to worry. So I can just continue to add code. Okay, so that's that. Now we have wait groups, but we still did not tell main that oh, it should wait. Wait, main is running a go routine also. So we want main to wait until everything is completed, till all the go routine completes. And this is gonna happen because both of our go routine is gonna call done, bring in that value that is being managed by the wait group to zero. And this tell wait that, oh, when I see that zero, that means all the go routine completed. And so now the main program can end. And so if you look, you go see that, oh, um, at some time, um, we had that our host two got a request from host saying, hello, send me the secret. And then host one responded with, um, host two responded with, hello, here is the secret, right? And so this is very simple case. Um, here's the secret. All we wanna do is to get our mechanism for these two to communicate and we see that's working. All right, so now that we have this, we can copy this and paste this as example two and continue. So in example two, we want to change things a little bit. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, um, sure, how do hosts identify themselves to each other? Well, what about if we create a structure called a host ID? So for example, we might say that our um, a host has a name and it has a set of a list of IP addresses. And this is the set of information that we need for a host to be able to uniquely identify a host. Now that we have that, then we can say, well, um, when host one wants to send a request to host two, it first must identify itself. And so for that reason, it creates, you know, a variable or this object and it says, okay, my name is host one. This, these are my IP address. In this case, I just want to have one IP address. And then now that it has that, it can now send this information to host two. And it can do that by saying, well, let me encode it and send it. So we're going to do something called gob encode. And that's because we've been doing this so often that we're going to just write a function to do either encoding. So gob encode is going to be a function that takes a value and just return a slice of byte that we can then send. Now, because of that reason, we want to send a slice of byte. Well, before we get too far ahead, let's write our gob encode function. And that is very simple. We have done it many, many times. So down at the bottom here, we're going to jump down and put our gob encode function. And it just takes a, an interface value, empty interface value. If not empty, empty, empty interfaces don't make sense to you, definitely check out my course that I now posted called Go Language for Tourists. And I cover how interfaces work, 
while they're this magical thing, they can take any value and so on. So definitely check that out. So anyway, gob encode function here takes this and encodes it as a gob doing gob encoding and returns a slice of byte. We've done this several times, so I'm gonna ignore that. So now we have a slice of byte that we can send on this channel. But since our channel here is string, we have to change this now to say, I wanna send a slice of, of bytes. But what I'm gonna actually do is I'm going to say, um, let's change all our um, types to say that oh, it's slice, a byte, slice of bytes. And we'll do that up here also. So let's do a byte of slice as the thing we're gonna send our channel. And we also need to do that here. And so, so we're gonna write a gob decode function, which does the opposite of encode, of course. And so that looks like this. And so we're gonna try and decode the value. If we can't decode it, then of course we're gonna print an error, return an error message. But otherwise to that, we're going to have decoded those set of bytes into this interface value that we were given. And for the host to, that looks like this. Just as before, we read a message and we're gonna call it like the client ID we know is gonna be a host ID value that we need. And so we're going to pass that to decode to say, hey, decode this message into this um, variable. And then of course, if we have problem decoding it, we're gonna log it. And then of course, we're gonna reply to the client that, hey, and since the client is a slice of bytes on that channel, we'll just cast a string that says, hey, try again. If not, we'll know that oh, we would have successfully decoded the message. So we can then prepare the response. We're going to prepare our message that we want to reply with. And then we pass it to a slice of bytes and we send back essentially the secret to this client. So if we run this, this should work fine now. We should be able to just do run code and we should see that our host two responded with blah, blah, blah. Now this is, these are our bytes. So maybe what we should really do in here for host one is when it says host two responded with is to string cast this to a string and save this. And then now if we run it, we see host two responded with hi host one. Here's the secret. All right. So let's close that and let's now move on to exercise three. So far, like I say, I'm keeping this very, very simple. And basically I'm just walking through the case of insecure communication to get into the point where we're going to do secure communication. But this is going to take a while because I want you to understand it. So we're going to move through very slow. Now here's where I'm going to let you know that oh, I'm going to, since our code is getting a bit long um, to hold in one file, right? You can see I'm doing a lot of scrolling and up and down and we need to add a bit more code. So what I'm going to do is sort of break things out. And so I'm not changing the code that we have. I'm just putting them in different files. So what I'm going to do is move host two to its own file. So I'll take this, I'll cut it and I'll create a file here called host two.go. And of course it's package is main. I'll just paste it. I save. It's going to pull in all the dependencies it needs. And I'll do the exact same thing for host one. So, so now if we go here and we do go um, run, for example, and we do exercise one and uh, I think, oh, I need to go in this directory. Let me go into the directory. I do go run exercise one, oh, exercise three is where we are. And I do this. Ah. All right, I need to save this to pull in some things. Um, I need to go back here and save here so it can get rid of some imports that we don't need. And ah, you see, this is the thing I'm always afraid of, that I'll modify the, in the wrong file, um, which is what I exactly what I did. I modify main from two. So let me close everything and then <laughs> close this guy. And let's go here and then um, I don't have host one and two anymore because I already created files, separate files for those. So I can get rid of those from here. And now if I save this, main is a much shorter app and I need to get rid of unused packages. And so um, let's clear our screen and let's try rerunning this again. 
And so we see that oh, it works the exact same way. All right, so exercise three was really just breaking up and organizing our code. Nothing new there. All right, so let's paste this and go on to exercise four. So in exercise four, um, what do we want to do? Host two is getting more secure now. And host two want to make sure that uh, um, it can trust whoever is asking it for the secret. So what does it do? It's going to get a message and after it decodes the message, it's going to say, well, do I trust this computer that's asking me or the client that's asking me for the secret? And so OS2 is going to pass that client to a function. It's going to call, is this a trusted host, right? This trusted host now is a very simple function because we haven't figured out yet exactly how we're going to determine how to do trust. You might have a hint already, like I said, from the previous um, parts when we talk about signature, but we're not going to implement that yet. So for right now, we're defaulting a trusted host to false. So the only thing I've changed in our code so far is this. If is not trusted host, then our message is going to be untrusted host, and we're going to log that, and we're going to send back that message to the client saying, oh, you are untrusted host. And since we're returning, we never get to the bottom here because right now this function always returns false. So let's run that and see. So we need to run that. All right, let's um, clear up our screen and run that in exercise four. And so as you can see, alarm untrusted host and we that's what host two responded with this message is being printed out by host one so okay so good we we have slightly better host two now that doesn't cough up information as easily as it was before so copy paste exercise five and in exercise five what we'll do is again close all of these this gets a bit confusing what we want is we want host one to be able to sign the um, its ID, right? If it can attach a signature with its host ID, then host two can verify that signature. Now, there's more to it than what I just said, but for now, let's just start off with host one signing its, signet, its host ID and then having host two verify that signature so if we can start get to that point then we can do other things and so i have this function let's call it create key and what it does is let's use log Russ. and all it does is it creates a key of a certain key size and it returns it of course we need a random number generator so rng is equals to ran that reader and that comes from the crypto package Right, so that's gonna be there. And now we're gonna generate the key and return it. What we want host one to be able to do is to create a key pair. Now, right now we're taking that return key and assign it to that um, variable, the special variable in Go, which means essentially that it gets thrown away, but we just really wanna make sure that our, our code works for now. And so if we go here, all right, let's clean up again. and everything still is the same. And we expect that because we're not using the key just yet. All we did is added the ability to say that we can create key. Okay, so let's move on to exercise six now where we're actually gonna take the key and use it for signature. And we're gonna focus on host one being able to sign with that key. It's going to use that private key to create a signature. And so here's my key I created, and then it's gonna call a function called sign my ID. This function simply takes the private key, my private key, and my ID, which is this thing, and create a signed key. We're gonna see what a signed key is and return that as the host key. Now that I have the host key that is a signed key, now it can send that off to host two and say, okay, here is my key, this is who I am, and it's signed, can you please send me the arm thing? So the only thing we need now is to have this method which is called sign my key. No, this method is very simple. 
Well, if we work sort of from the middle, what we're going to see is that we're going to use Gaussian code to encode the ID, which is the source ID that is given to us. Once we have that as a slice of byte, we're going to compute a hash of it. Now remember this SHA-256 um, creates a 32-byte hash. We're going to then use RSA package to do sign that hash. And so that gives us our encrypted or signed ID. So if we have a signed ID now, we can take that if there is no error and we can add it to this thing called sign value that signature. What is sign value that signature? Sign value that signature is a variable of type host um, signed host ID. So let me show you what a sign host ID looks like. Sign host ID is just a type, a new type that contains the host ID. Now from now on, we'll call this host ID the subject, All right? So we're going to say that a sign host ID has a field called subject, which is information about the host or whoever. And then we have this thing called the signature, which again is the sign hash of this information, which the receiver can use the signature to verify the source ID. And so now we have a signature on this value. Now, why are we sending the public key? Well, because the host that you're communicating with doesn't know who you are necessarily and have your public key already. So you send along your public key so they can use it to verify the signature that you send along. Now, of course, we have to assume that oh, they trust your public key, but we're not there yet. For now, we're sending them everything they need to verify the signature. And so they can verify the signature and say, oh, okay, the signature is valid. So now that we have that, we can initialize host ID by saying that oh, the subject is gets the ID or this um, host ID, and then the public key, right? So hopefully this all makes sense. Um, all this is just stuff that I did in the previous video, this whole signature stuff, so I'm hiding it inside of a function. And so here, we just create a key, we use that key to assign the ID, and then we send that ID now, the sign ID, which is this, to host two. On host two side, what does it need to do with this um, sign thing? Well, it can take it and um, decrypt it. But for now, what we're going to do is if we run this now as it is, we'll see it how it's going to fail. That's because when it is expecting a host ID, but it's going to instead get a signed host ID. So let's clear the screen and run exercise six. And so of course this fail, right? It's not the expected thing. Okay, so in exercise seven now, we can fix that. Remember I tell you one thing at a time, I'm building up slowly, exercise seven. So in exercise seven, let's clear the screen. In exercise seven, we just need to work on host two. Host two is not going to get the client, but rather it's getting, you know, whatever this host ID thing is, whatever we want to call this. Um, let's call this the identity here. So, so it gets the identity from this client and it's read it in, but this thing is a secure, a signed, sorry, signed host ID. Well, signed host ID is something that's part of, I mean, it's all in the same package, but just for organization, I'll put it in main so that we can say that oh, the thing that they're all sharing is sort of in main. So if I put this here, it's gonna allow us to see it a little bit better. The difference between a host ID and a signed host ID. And so now host two can say that oh, oh I'm using, expecting now a signed host ID, which I'm going to pass to gob decode this ID, ID, the identity of that host. And then um, once it um, parses out the identity, well, it just needs to pass this to this function. And we know that how this function uses. So we're going to say identity 
and it's assigned post ID. And this time, our function has something it can work with. Instead of simply returning false, it can actually um, start testing that value. So to see if the signature is correct. So the, the first thing it can do is compute the hash and then see if it was the same as what it got from um, the client. So it does a gobbing code of that subject information and it computes the hash for, for itself, right? Remember that? And now that it has the hash, it can check and see, is this hash valid? And the way to do that, we have functions for this, is that it can say, well, I have the public key for who was supposed to sign it, right? Who was supposed to, who had made us sign this hash? And now I'm going to pass the RSA verify function to say, use this public key and SHA-255 and this hash, which is a slice in this case, and compare it or verify it against the signature that was provided. Notice we don't have to decrypt the signature with a public key and then compare it to see if that was the exact same thing as the hash. That's how we did it by hand in like um, part six or something. We can just ask this verify function to do the hard work for us. And if we don't have an error message, if we have an error message or if that verification failed, then we can say it how the signature is, is false or we don't trust this client, right? And of course, if um, the signature is correct, we can still say that, oh, you know what? The signature is valid, but we don't know who signed this message. Because that's, at the end of the day, um, we don't know who really signed this. We have a signature for this host, but we don't know who signed it. In this case, the host actually signed its own thing. So um, let's see, identity, that subject that name. So that's who um, is making the request now. Does that make sense? And so even though the signature is valid, we don't know or we can't trust that simply because you sign your own ID and say, you know, it's as if I ask you, well, do you have an ID? And you pull out a piece of paper, put your name on it and then sign it and then say, yes, here's my ID. I signed it. That's not enough. We have to make sure to who gave you this ID is someone who I also trust. And so at least we have the basic in place. So right now, host two is rejecting anything. Even if it's signed, it's still rejecting it. So let's run this and hopefully our code isn't broken. Um, let me go back, um, save a few things to make sure that uh, we haven't broken anything. So save this and then let's go and run exercise seven. And we should see that, um, yes, we have a valid signature but the signer is unknown. And so, and so let's copy this, let's paste this, and let's call it example eight. Now, some of the code we've written, like I said, it's here in main and um, it's shared between um, our two pieces of code. If we think of them as different um, pieces of code, right? Host one and host two. So the first thing I wanna do is um, sort of separate them. So the first thing I'm going to do is say that oh, this piece of code that I have to do with encoding and decoding, I'll cut this out from here. And so let's cut this and I'm going to create a subdirectory called serialize. And then within that subdirectory, um, I'll create a go that serialize, uh, maybe gob encode, gob, uh, that go, right? Um, and so this file will contain everything that has to do with encoding and decoding. So it's in its own package. So let's see, uh, come on, package serialize. All right, so that's in its own package now. And so if we go back to OS1 and OS2, they're gonna complain a bit because um, they don't have access to this. Now, the other thing that I need to do is, let me close this again, make sure I'm working with the right thing. So I need to make these functions, um, you know, public, ah, come on. So I'm saying G for gob, make it public, as in go, lowercase in a package mean that you can't see it. 
So make those public and then I'll go to one here and then I'll say gob anything that's using gob um, it's really in the serialize and gob so save that so uh, gob so save that and that's good now for host 2 I'll do the same thing I'm gonna say everything that says gob let me highlight them all and then I'm gonna say serialize that gob gob save it and so that works and notice you're gonna see that it brings in the serialized package from our exercise 8 in our module sec and the reason why i put a module file is because i didn't want it to have that ugly long name that goes all the way back up to the root of the project so that's all all right so that's taken care of now why is this complaining um do we do any serialize in here um nope we don't do any serialize okay so we just had some package that we weren't using um the other thing i'd like to do is because i want to introduce trust we can't have host one how is host one we can't have host one sort of create its own id and then sign it that has to be offloaded to someone else just like oh you couldn't create your own id and then just walk around and give it to people they're they're not going to trust you so we need an issuer so I'm going to create a directory called issuer. And issuer is going to take on the responsibility of creating um, the signatures for these hosts. So it's going to have a few functions. So let's do that. And so what we'll do is we'll bring all that stuff that we were doing before in main. So for example, let's make sure we're working on the right files here. So we have issuer, we have main. And so previously in main, we we're doing all this stuff about the host ID and stuff. This stuff goes away from main and it goes and become the responsibility of the issuer. The issuer is this third party thing that is gonna be responsible for what is a host ID? Do we have all the information to identify a host? And what does a sign um, host ID look like? The other thing is that we're going to create in a key, we're gonna move that from main into our issuer. That responsibility becomes something that the issuer is doing and it's going to keep it private. Um, nobody else should be able to see that. And the whole key signing thing that we had before in host one, well, host one doesn't get to do its own key signing anymore. That becomes a responsibility of the issuer. And so what we'll do is we'll introduce a new function that's called, um, that can be called by anyone who accesses this package and it's gonna be create a new host ID, right? New signed host ID. Now, let's look at how the issuer work. The issuer, just as before, we had our host ID. The issuer now, we put in information for the issuer within its own struct, so. The issuer has a name and a public ID, um, public key that it's going to others can use to verify. And then the signed host ID is just the subject, and then information about who signed it, and then the signature for this particular host. This is allow that this allow this information once a host has another host have this information, they can verify the signature using the issuer info. And then they know that how they can trust this host because this host was signed by this issuer they trust. Okay. So what is exactly in this issuer information? Well, it's just the issuer name and the public key, which we can see when we call a new signed host ID, we take the host name, we take the list of IP address and we do some verification. We can imagine that we're saying, you know, host name cannot be less than two characters and you must have at least one IP address to be a valid host. Because if you don't have an IP address, how are people going to get to you? You just don't have a name. And then now the issuer is the one creating that host ID and signing it. And then it returns it. Now, how exactly does it sign it? Well, it uses its private key, right? It creates a private key and it uses that. And the private key, notice the private key never leave the issuer. Nobody else has the issuer's private key. And the sign-in is pretty much like we saw before. We construct a sign value 
and it is just the signed horse ID and the subject is set to whichever horse we are interested, um, we want to create the signature for. And then we serialize that um, host information, the subject information, sign it, attach it to the, you know, signed host ID information. And then the only thing left to do is for us to put our own information as the issuer to say, we're the issuer and this is our public key that you can use to verify that signature that we put on this thing. And then we return it. Now we can go back to host one. Now again, this is quite a bit. We can go back to host one and we can change it to say that when you want an ID, instead of you creating your own ID and trying to sign it, we're not going to do that at all. Instead, what you're going to do is call the issuer and say, give me a new signed host ID. And this is my host name. And these are my IP addresses. I provide the information that you need in order to give me a signed ID. And if for whatever reason, of course, the issuer doesn't like the information that was provided, well, that's going to fail and we log it. After this point, now we know that how we have a valid host ID. So, so what is this message? Error message. Oh, I have to error. There we go. And so after this, now I can request information from that remote host. Well, why don't we also make it so that a request is something that includes the message we want plus the our identity information, right? The sign information that we want to send to um, the other host. So let's create a variable which we're going to put in main and not variable, a type rather, and we'll call it a request. And the request is going to be from some host who has a signed host ID. And this is the message of whatever it is that they want, right? And so host one, then all it needs to do is create a signed, um, a request object and send it over. So host one creates a request object and it sends it over. And that is just going to be, um, let's get rid of this. And it's going to be the request that's encoded. Okay, so now let's take a look at how we've changed host one. Host one no longer creates its own signed host ID. We outsource that to a third party. Host one calls the issuer and says, hey, can you please give me something that identifies me? And I trust you. And when I present it to somebody else who trusts you, they can trust me because we're both issued ID or we both have the common trust. And so once it host one has its ID now, it can create a request and it says this request is from and it gives its ID and it provides a message. Now for host two, we have to make some changes too. So, okay, so let's go through the changes that we have to make for host two. For host two, well, what change? Well, it is now getting a request from host one. So there's our request variable. So it gob decode it. And if that is okay, remember the request has a from, which is information about who this is from that's supposed to be um, its identity from our trusted um, issuer. So now it passes that to its trust. So its trust is gonna take this signed host ID from the issuer. And it's going to do the same thing. It's going to use the subject information in this um, identity, and it's going to do the hash for itself. And then it's going to use the public key that is part of that identity to verify it. And then if that doesn't give it any, um, any if it doesn't get an error message with that, well, it knows that oh, this is a valid signature, but it still cannot trust it because it doesn't know who that is, right? So we're gonna do that part next. So at least this piece of code should work now. So let's see if we can run it. So this is example eight. 
uh, we should still expect uh, it's okay oh all right so this is a bit much for us to run this way okay so let's run exercise 8 and we'll do that by going to the exercise 8 directory and then we'll do go build and then do this and so we have an executable now and then if we do this and we run it we should see that our, our code still work we're able to verify the signature but we still cannot trust it all right so nothing broke but at least all the stuff with the issuer is in place so eight pretty much worked like seven except in eight we have an issuer so this is the last example it's a long road and so let's paste it let's call it exercise nine and i want to make sure that i don't mess this up so i'm going to close everything else that i was using before and so in next exercise nine um let's get rid of the thing that we built so there rm exercise eight so let's clear up our screen and so what we want host two to do when it's um, verifying um, if it's no if it should trust a host or not is to use a public key for an issuer that we trust okay so what that means is that we need a way to get the issuer um, public key and then present it to host two so for that reason we're going to go back to our issuer and we're going to add a function, one function, this. And this function is simply to return the issuer's public key. And then in main, what we're gonna do is use that and pass it to host two. So we're gonna say, for example, issuer that, you know, get, give me your public key. Um, so why does this not, um, Yep, let's just do public key. Maybe it needs some time to compile. But anyway, get to your public key. And yep, at least we pull in the package. And now for host two, we need to update it to say that our host two accepts a public key that we are gonna say is the trusted key. So we're gonna provide with host two with you know the trusted or the trust public key, yeah, trusted public key um, that it should use, RSA that public key. So now that we created OS2 by giving it this information on where the trusted key, when OS2 is ready to verify trust, it should pass that same public key, trusted public key, trusted key. It should pass that on to this function. And this function can then use that now and say trusted key, you know, the RSA key that public that I was given. It can now use this to say, all right, if all of this is fine, well, then let me check and see if the key that is public is also the same key that I was given. And so what we can do now is compare those two keys. And for that, we can just simply use um, bytes that equal, or you can say, why is that equal? Compare these two buffers. Remember, these are just two buffer slices. And if they're not equal, then we know that our, the signature, while it was valid, it wasn't from someone we trust. So we can say that our um, you know, identity, that issuer, that name is the ID of the issuer, and we don't trust that issuer. So now, we can put that there and then now we can get rid of this and say if we get to this point then it's true this host is a trusted host because the key that we that came on the message that signed that um host id is a key that we trust because we compare the two and so now in exercise nine if we cd to or oh, we already in nine if we said go build uh okay so exercise nine and let's go to host two and then change this also to be exercise nine so okay they all point into the wrong package that's why so let's do that build okay now we build and uh, now we're successful and then we build exercise nine and then we run it and then there you go we were successfully able finally to get the secret and the reason why we can get it is because 
host two was able to trust host one. Why was host two able to trust host one? Because host two have a public key for somebody that it trusts. And so when that somebody, that third party issuer signs something, it can only trust, the, it agrees to trust those things that were signed by the same key. As a comparison, and because we, this video is so long already, verify this for yourself. Do example exercise 10, copy exercise nine, call it 10. Make sure that you update all the code to, you know, so that it says exercise 10 here. Otherwise, you're gonna run into some issue. And here's what I want you to do. This is our issue here. Copy this and create a bad issuer, right? Issuer number two. It's very simple. Just call this issuer number two. Copy this and then put it in a, not a directory um, and call it issuer two. And of course you have to put it in a different package, call it issuer two or bad issuer. Change the name of it if you like. So um, when you see the message from Omnitrust to Megatrust or something and have it generate a, um, a host key. And in main, what you're gonna do is you're going to have host, a second host use that other key. And while your host is going to send message to the same host too that uses the public key, but because they might use a different um, trust, then see if it would decode it. Does that make sense? And so you'll see that how it is going to again fail and it's not going to get the secret. So that's a simple thing to try. Um, hopefully this makes sense. I try to not like walk through all the details of me typing it up, but also because I know that was going to be long, but I hope that oh, when I put the code in place, I was able to explain it. If somehow you think that I didn't do a good job of that, still thumbs up the video, but you know, there's some parts of it that you didn't understand, I'll attack those parts and clarify it. But be specific, tell me exactly where in the video you didn't get it or I wasn't clear. I thought I did a good job, but I could be wrong, right? So let me know, I welcome the feedback. Um, but yes, please, please, thumbs up the video, thumbs up the video and subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Um, see you in the next video and we're going to talk about X509 certificate which ties into exactly what we did here so make sure that you're keeping up with the material. Alright, bye, see you, have a great day.